Good morning everyone. Fred Wagner here with Papa's Painting Tips. I'm uh, doing a piece for one of my relatives, my cousin. He asked me to do an eagle. Uh, he sent me the reference picture that he wanted me to do and I drew it up yesterday. I've got a uh, cre uh, crescent illustration board, uh, airbrush board, to the equivalent to the new 205, 205.3. This one would be 205 because it's the 15 by 20 size. Um, I drew it out with a Rembrandt uh, orange pencil and this orange pencil I don't want, especially in the white fur or the white feathers in the eagle's head. So as I'm painting, I will go back in and uh, erase those lines out so that they don't show through because most of this is white. So I'm going to take advantage of the, the white board as much as I can and uh, paint from there. I've got my trusty old kind of nasty looking photo glove. I got to go buy some more. I'm using my custom Micron SB again with uh, ETAC paints. I'm using uh, Payne's Gray and uh, one or two drops of uh, blue into the Payne's Gray so that it uh, gives it a little bit of that blue shadow tone rather than just straight gray. I don't want straight gray. Uh, I cannot, I'm going to also probably mist back over some spots with a little bit of blue. It's just, uh, I want mostly gray. Because this picture has mostly gray, a little bit of sepia, it looks like mixed in. And, uh, but I want to keep it as photorealistic as I can. And what I'm going to be doing is almost like misting into all these shadow areas around the feathers to get them to stand out. Okay, I'm going to get started today. I'm trying this again on my phone. And I'm going to try to make a full length video out of it. So it's going to take a lot of time. But I'm going to start over here. Hopefully this time I won't get my shoulder in the way. I'm also standing at the moment because this is so high on my tabletop easel up here. That I can't paint comfortably sitting down at the moment. I will when I get down here. So hopefully we'll get the video straightened away. Right now I'm just doing light misting tones on this fur and then I'll go back, or I keep saying fur, I'm so used to doing fur. And then I'll go back in and uh, define the feathers by scratching into them. But I got, I'm trying to pay attention to the feather areas where the shadows are. And being that I can erase back into it if I overshoot or that, that's fine. Once I get most of these feathers in, I'm going to go back in and paint all this background. And that's that. Paying attention to all this is super hard. I'm not worried about making exact lines in this it, uh, at the moment. Right now, mainly what I'm concentrating on is the uh, dark contrast in the feathers, the dark in the shadowed areas. And here I, I can uh, almost blast that in a little bit more. Trying to stay off the beak as much as possible, even though there's some shadowing on the beak from the light source. Yeah. 
And uh, yeah, the last video I did, I had a problem with uh, the volume. I had the app set up muted, so I tried to add in to it, and it didn't really come out that well. I didn't really like it that much. So I'm going to reframe from that this time by just shooting the video and then uploading it later and try to piece it all together this time. So. And I don't know if you noticed the way I'm holding this. I got my finger overlapping this trigger. Some people like it like that. I find I have less control. So if I overlap it, take take advantage of this curve, I can just use the tip of my finger to pull that back slightly to gain control on the airbrush. And again, I don't want to go too heavy because I don't want this fur. Fur. Uh, I'm stuck in fur. I don't want these feathers to become too dark. It doesn't take much finger movement to get that most of these feathers are pin feathers so they're really soft the only feathers that become quite defined are down here uh, where the uh, neck and chin feathers if a bird has a chin uh, <laughs> blend over the top of the body feathers the brown body feathers so i've drawn in so many of these feather markings because it's it's very confusing where you're at in the reference i don't have the ability to do a layover and what I mean by a layover is uh, to take another sheet with this image printed out the same size to flip over and lay over it and then go up and down to see where I'm at to make sure I got the right spot so I gotta I gotta really eyeball this and guesstimate where I'm at, paying attention to my reference. Of course, in here, this is all squiggly and little tiny bumps. So I'm not going to do a whole lot. I'm just using a little, almost like creating skin texture, doing that figure eight. That artists use to create the illusion and then I'm gonna come in and hit some of those highlights real loose real general I'm using uh, right around 25 psi and my reduction is uh, ray round one to one uh, with the water to the etac paint. And the paint is not breaking; it's staying nice and soft. And the reason I got a little blue mixed in with my paints gray this time is because in the Payne's Gray there is already blue but being this is on white feathers your shadows on white are always blue where this is a darker uh, background on these so you don't need as much Or you need more shadowing in it. 
and to keep it more to the natural, I want a blue rather than just a pure gray. Pure gray would flatten it out and not give you the nice texture and tone and realist look to that paint. And what I'm doing too is the shadow areas underneath. This is the feather top. I right? the light source is hitting here. And then next to the feather is your shadow going underneath. Same all the way around here. And I'm at the moment just putting in the light locations. I'm not staying real tight to it because once I erase into that to get the orange markings off it will soften those edges plus it will bring out the highlight of where the light's hitting it. All right, I'm going to stop there and I'm going to go in Oops, drop that. I'm going to go in with soft eraser on this because I found it works best to take off this orange line. I don't have to totally obliterate it and make it disappear. Just enough that when I come back in for ne more definition, it'll be there so I can see it. But not enough so that when you're standing back, the naked eye picks it up. And going over to darken those uh, little edges, it'll... Uh, cover it. You won't notice it. As you see, I don't, I don't have to be real exact with this at the moment. I'll go in with my scratch brush and my harder eraser when I go to define those highlights. But as you can see already, all this area right in here where those orange marks were showing up, they're gone. You can't see them. Over here where they're still on, you can pick them out if you really look. I'm leaving them there real, real faint. I can see them close up. When you step back, your eye really can't pick them up no more. That's the nice thing about working on this illustration board. Is you can do that. You can work in that way. And this Rembrandt orange erases actually quite nicely off this smooth illustration board surface. The only reason I picked the illustration board over my synthetic paper is uh, the size. Okay. Well, that's looking quite nice already. I don't need real sharp, hard 
lines in this. So now I'm going to go in, excuse my funny looking face, and I'm going to give a little bit of the indication of these feathers. And just like for, I gotta pay attention to their direction, size, and shape. Hey, this one is this. Now I'm only gonna do this one, this part, uh, little sections now, right in here. as I begin to build these feathers right off here. Most of the pin feathers are just long, straight feathers, almost like a thick tuft of fur. They're fuzzy on the edge, so they don't need a lot of defining. You know, I had mentioned before that I needed to go out and get uh, the refills for this. I did get them. I haven't had to use them yet. There's still a little tiny bit left in this brush and I don't need it. Right. I'm going to go back in and start. defining those feathers a little more. This time I'm going to be a little tighter. I wish I could get this reference up here so I could see it better about. Mm. Trying to see if I've got anything around that I could sit it up on top of a box or something. To get it up close to my focal point. Mm -hmm. Well, I could do that. Wife might kill me. I was thinking of putting a couple glasses up there <laughs> to elevate it, but they're not going to get it that high. You could get it. I got an idea here. Excuse me while I try to play you Houdini here. Think, think, think. Always trying to finagle something. Let's see, this is my. Yeah, that definitely will put it up there. That's pretty good. Oh yeah, that's much nicer. <laughs> that's that's my old helmet stand for painting, airbrushing helmets, and now it's turned into my Lucid tracing stand, and now it's my iPad holder. <laughs> I'm always trying to make something out of nothing. Sure, starving artist. I know I can hear it. Okay, I'm going to start right here. Let's see, we got some. Hmm. Hoping my shoulder is not in your way. I don't think it is. I did a couple little test runs with this. Almost think I want to 
make this paint a little more transparent. I'm going to add a little transparent base into this so I can build my layers a little slower. And the more transparent base you use, the lighter obviously and more transparent the paints, paint becomes, but it doesn't get thinner. But being that I've added some base to it, as if I were adding actual paint, I'm going to give another drop of water, drop or two of water. To redu get, keep my reduce, reduction the same. Reduction. For some reason this brain don't work. Okay. Alright, let's see how thin we've got it. I don't want to super saturate it and oversaturate the paper but definitely wanna yeah that's much better it's gonna flow a lot better on here I can definitely hit those little spots without overpowering it by mistake I'm using dagger strokes in here and misting techniques now as I go. And there's so many feathers on here. You don't have to be exact. It, it, I mean, so long as you stay to the general likeness of the fur uh, for lack of a better word I mean I don't think anybody's gonna sit there and uh, get out the magnifying glass and overlay it and try to see if I'm exact it's a painting it's not a photograph it's my interpretation of this picture Down here, this, these feathers curl underneath the edge of this beak. So they're a little bit darker. Hmm. Okay, let me see. I got to figure something out here. Okay. This is coming down and it wraps into this way. And right here there's a darker spot. Always clear your needle every so often. I'm going to use my Q-tip trick. Now, I know a lot of people teach that you got to use a deucer to clean the needle tip. It's not really true. You don't have to. Water is sufficient. It's a water-based paint. I would save, save your reducer. Use water. I mean... Now it's flowing a lot better right there. Getting into all these little nooks and crannies in between the feathers.
kind of like to do this as a live feed, but it, uh, I don't want too many videos going out. People get sick of it. And you probably say, I've got some haters out there that don't like my long videos and they don't like my commentary. It's like, not a problem. Don't watch. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. No, I'm, I don't want to be mean. And one thing you do have to pay attention to is you got to make make sense out of this because if if you got the bumps that you drew and uh, you don't let the shadows match up to those bumps then it's not going to make sense so now I got a little too dark on that feather I just painted I pulled back on the trigger a little too much it's a little bit harder to stand and do this unless you're working really large so I'm gonna go in just use my scratch brush lightly touch on those two spots that I just got in there that were too dark and bam they're almost gone you can't even tell that I bumped it so now I'm gonna go back in here Getting confused in my own reference picture. Oh, I don't like how that wiggles up there. That drops. I don't have money for a new iPad. If anybody wants to donate uh, towards this I consider it my ministry. Uh, if you wish to donate, you can uh, send a payment or a contribution to Fred A W sixty one at Rochester dot R R dot com is my link to my PayPal account. And you can donate to help keeping this painting going. You know, you're, most of the people watching are fellow artists, so most people don't have that extra cash. They're trying to save up for their own paintings, which is perfectly fine. I know that sensation. I know that feeling. Unfortunately, times are hard in these end times. With hacking and so many bad things going on in this world. But how's that looking on here? It looks much darker than really is. Right now I'm, I'm paying attention to the little striations and uh, feathery movement 
if you want to call it that. It's funny how the camera makes it look way darker than it really is. It's looking a lot closer in there. Now what I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to give it a little mist over all that. And come in one last time. Once this background is painted in. Now I'm going to go back in with the eraser, not the scratch brush so much, and pick out some of these sharp highlights. I'm going to start down here. I wonder. No. Okay. I just wanted to make sure the backlighting wasn't affecting the camera too much. I'm mainly heading the brightest spots with this eraser. Yeah, stop bending. My back is starting to really hurt again. Now I'm going to go back in with the scratch brush. I don't really want to use my X-Acto tool in this because being it's that fluffy feather look, the X-Acto tool would be a little too harsh of lines. I don't know if you notice how many times I look at the reference. I don't, I don't think you can see my face up there. No. Uh, I am constantly looking up at the reference. When uh, I, I technically did not learn to draw and paint from any school or anything, uh, like most artists, self, I'm self-taught, you know, as a little kid, you know, my mom couldn't afford lessons or anything, so I pretty much taught myself, and, uh, one of the things I did learn when I ended up getting to high school and uh, the little bit of college that I was able to uh, attend. I learned most of your attention when painting should be three quarters of your time spent looking at your references or your model 
whatever you're drawing through from your still life. And the other last quarter of your time should be spent looking at your painting. And the reason being for all that is uh, your mind wants to fill in the little gaps, okay? And so if you're looking at your painting all the time and not the reference as much, you're no longer painting what's there, but you're painting what's in your mind that you thought you saw. And you don't want to do that because just like in a witness situation, what you thought you saw sometimes and most of the time isn't really what you saw at all. Does that mean every witness is wrong? No. Some people have a more eidetic memory that they can recall more details. And kind of, uh, most artists fall into that category, having eidetic memory. Because once you get used to drawing a certain subject, you'll find it becomes easier to draw that subject again from mem strictly from memory. Now, one reason I use my trace app isn't because I can't draw. Uh, from still life or from a photo reference. I can definitely draw quite well. It's just the time transferring this image took almost two hours, uh, hour and a half, maybe, maybe a little less. I wasn't timing myself, but it felt like a long time. It felt like I was forever doing line upon line. And truthfully, it's a good thing because the more reference lines you can incorporate into your drawing, the more accurate the final painting's gonna become. So if I wanted to draw this physically out, uh, with no, hang on a second, with no reference, uh, well, I, I, I'm saying this wrong. If I wanted to draw this out free, totally freehand, uh, without the trace, trace app, it most likely would have taken me about 10 to 20 hours to get all those lines right. And there would have been a lot of erasing done to get it accurate. But with these reference lines drawn in from the trace app, I can find my spots for my highlight a lot easier and scratch them in. Once I get all this scratched in in this little spot that I'm working on, I can then go back in with my Payne's Gray Blue Mix and really crisp up some of these little spots in here 
that are getting a little lost. But as you can see, that's really starting to take shape and uh, come to life. I gotta stop the video here in a second. Because the laundry buzzed. Woo laundry day. I know what you're thinking. Why doesn't your wife do laundry? Now, now. She's at work. I'm at home enjoying painting with you wonderful people. I don't want to be selfish. I can help take care of laundry. I've got the crock pot chicken in. And we got stuff to do tonight. So, gonna briefly stop here, be right back, and continue on. It's already been 41. Okay, short little breather for me. And I'm back here. Yeah, let's see. Now, uh, where was I? A lot of, uh, you know, a lot of people might be wondering, what what did I mean when I said my ministry? And uh, let me take a couple minutes here to explain myself a little bit better. Hang on. This goes up there. So that means that. Okay. Uh, what I'm talking about is uh, when I became a Christian man, and I'm probably going to lose some people here. I hope not, though. I hope you bear with me and, and just listen. Uh, when I became a Christian man, one of my desires was to use my airbrush and artistic talent in some form or fashion to serve the Lord, my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, now I'll probably get those thumbs down on the video now because I just said that, but hey, it's all for him. But uh, I, for a long time, suffered with the desire how I can use this to serve the Lord and uh, I tried my best to do a GoDaddy page and tried to paint for other people and on uh, people that contacted me through uh, through my airbrush page and which was fine but sometimes subject matter that came up was slightly questionable especially to my faith and contradictory now um, I'm not condemning the person persons that requested these things it's you know that's for them not uh, for me to judge that but I wanted to find some way and uh, through prayer and seeking the Lord's wisdom the one day I found an answer in my head and that answer said, freely I gave to thee, so freely give to others. Now, you know, there is a passage in the Bible that says about freely receiving uh, the gift of grace, that through receiving Jesus Christ, he would give you the gift of eternal life freely. Now, there's always, there's eternal life anyways, uh, but eternal life with Christ in heaven is what he's 
the Bible tells us about. So anyways, uh, I wanted to uh, serve him with my talents, with my abilities. And because of that answer, I decided that I would do these videos. I would gift my paintings rather than try to earn money off of others. And I would trust in the Lord to supply all my needs. And so far, I have not lacked one thing. I have plenty of surfaces to paint on. I have plenty of paint. <laughs> I've got almost two full huge drawers of paint down here. Um, I don't lack for people wanting my artwork. And uh, when I do give something to someone, I don't require anything of them. Uh, other than to cover the shipping, maybe. And uh, if they feel led that they want to donate something, you're free to do that. I'm not telling anyone that they have to Pay me. It's up to the gift if they want to give. If they don't want to give, God bless them and I'll give them what I can freely. So that's that's what I mean by ministry. It's my way to serve the Lord with my artwork. I don't know if you can see this. I'm painting in the black. Just getting it in there for the eyeball. Now a lot of people would say go ahead and use a stencil for that or cut out and I'm not saying I wouldn't do that if I had some brisket paper I probably would but I do not own any or have any brisket paper and I've got enough control still with my hands that I can lay this in freehand. And I'm not worried about misting over here and that because there is some gray in there. roughly putting this in right now and then I'll come in and define it later let's see this comes down equal to the eyeball right there so this actually tuft is coming down here So, I've been uh, just enjoying. The other thing you might wonder is, hey, why is this dude got, he must be rich because, you know, he can stay home and paint every day and uh, be at home. And there's a reason I'm here all the time. Uh, several years back, I had what's called an artery dissection. Uh, my right carotid artery dissected. 
on its own. I was a truck driver. I was miserable. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with truck driving. I just didn't want to be there. I just didn't want to do it. And uh, the one day I was driving down to a stop uh, just before Christmas 2006. And uh, actually, it was the day before we left to or the day before Christmas vacation from work. And uh, I'm driving down to my delivery, which was a, a 45 minute, almost an hour drive to the stop. And I was rushing to get everything done so I could get home and go home and cel start celebrating the holiday with my beautiful wife and my little children. And uh, so suddenly I had a uh, huge pain in my head, right side above my right eye. And uh, and it progressed to the side of my right side of my whole head, my temple, my face, and uh, I got to my stop, and I walked in, and I had this massive headache. My eyes were bugging me. My stomach was nauseous as can be, and uh, thought I was gonna throw up. So I asked the gentleman at the loading dock, said, uh, do you guys have any ibuprofen or something? I've got a wicked headache and I'm not feeling very well. So while they were unloading my truck, they went and got me some aspirin and uh, I went into the bathroom and looked in the mirror and my right pupil was so constricted you could barely see the black of the pupil and they finished with me I came I got in the truck started driving back to Rochester New York Fairport area and I asked the gentleman at my company's loading dock, could you please unload my truck? I feel so sick. Um, I don't think I can do it. And I would leave the truck parked where it was at the dock. And he said, sure, go ahead. Second shift, everybody's, all the other drivers were back and there was no other deliveries coming in because of the holiday. He would definitely do that for me. It was a weekend holiday this time. It was his, Christmas was on a Sunday, on Sunday that year. So I went home. My wife's like, hey honey, let's, uh, let's go to Applebee's for dinner. And I'm like, I can't eat. I can't eat nothing. I am sick as a dog to my stomach. My head is absolutely in pain. All I want to do is lay down and try to get rid of this headache. And I have been popping ibuprofen since then. And uh, luckily my daughter worked at a opti um is an optician and she worked at a local uh, doctor's office for eye care and he she had when I woke up the next day all the capillaries in that eye 
had bursted and my eye was all bloody looking. Pupil was still tiny. My head was still hurting. And my wife thought I had pink eye. So my daughter, I, my wife talked to my daughter and she was like, I'll call my boss and uh, maybe he can make a special trip in and see you since you're having this headache. That's not a good sign. So we rushed in to the doctor's optometrist's office and he thought I had an eye infection or that I had poked myself in the eye with something and I wasn't aware of it. He, he just didn't, didn't really know what was going on. He tried to dilate the pupil to get to look at the back of the eye and he couldn't get it to dilate, to open up. He kept putting more and more drops in. I don't, I don't think I, I could see straight for the, for a day or two because of that. And uh, so he's looking at it, and he's like, "I'm not sure." So he said, "You know, keep an eye on it." Ha ha ha! Pun. Um, if the headaches don't stop. They'll try something else. So, uh, I went home with steroid drops and eye drops, pumping that in my eye. Went back to work the next week. Uh, well, we celebrated Christmas, obviously, as, as much as I could with a killer headache going on still. And uh, three weeks later, well, actually, the next week, I went into work and uh, they, there wasn't much driving going on and we were doing a lot of painting in the shop and stuff. So I was doing my best and I was popping ibuprofen and aspirin and all kinds of whatnots. And uh, the following week, New Year's came and went. I went into work <clears throat> after New Year's. And we suddenly, I, I got done with my deliveries for the day. And I got a call to come back into the office. On my way, while I was on my way home, my daughter came and picked me up. Because my wife and I share one car. And she wasn't home. So on my way home from work, they called me back in. I ran back in and sure enough, because they were restructuring the whole plant, they were letting go all the higher paid employees. I had been there 11 years. Everybody that was there for 15, 20 years were gone. And I was gone. Start to look for another job. And I had two possible positions I could take after a bunch of interviews and, and searching. And then the doctor called and said, how's your headache? I said, I still have one. He's like, I want you to go see someone else, a neurologist, uh, opto neurologist. And I'm like, okay. Wasn't really thinking much of it. They send me in and uh, he's looking at my eye. He's like, well, there's two reasons this happens. Because he was struggling to get the pupil to dilate also. And he says, uh, he says, you could either have an artery dissection because what this looks like is Horner's syndrome, which is a lack of blood flow to the back of the eye, or it's a stroke. We don't know. So they said the only way to know for certain is go for an MRI. So he's like, I don't want you to wait. I want you to do it today. So they sent me for an emergency MRI. 
And I'm like, oh yeah, they're not going to find nothing. And on my way home, I had picked up my father-in-law from the bus company because I borrowed his car to go for the MRI. And he got out. He was driving bus for school buses. And uh, picked him up. I got a phone call on my cell phone. And they said, get in here right away. We got to talk to you. So I immediately called my wife. I'm like, oh crap. Honey, something's wrong. Something bad. I don't know. But they want me in right away. So she's like, okay, I'll meet you there. So I drove into the doctor's office and that's when they told me. They said my right carotid artery had dissected into three layers. Blood was clotted behind the layers. I should not be alive. I should have had a massive heart attack or a... I should have had a massive heart attack or a major stroke at that point in time, but for some reason, and they don't know why, it didn't happen. My blood pressure was 210 over 160. My head was hurting still. They said, we're gonna put you on blood thinners. And being that it happened spontaneously, which was the other uh, miracle that I was still alive, because most of them will kill you. It's almost as bad as an aneurysm. Uh, they said, we'll put you on blood thinners and keep an eye on you. You'll have to have a MRI every three to six months and see how your progress is. And then it became my wife and I deciding whether it would be better if I just go back to work and treat it as if nothing happened or do I apply for disability and continue on as best as we can. So being that she was so scared, I took her advice about going on disability and seeing if I get accepted, which took a lot quite a while and here I am today and as I speak to you right now I have a migraine I almost don't even want to paint at the moment and in fact that probably will be stopping soon myself because it's starting to make my stomach nauseous now the artery has healed as best as it could it's not a hundred percent. Never will be. I've got macular degener degeneration. Wet or dry, I don't remember. Uh, I have microvascular disease with high T2 spots on the brain. I asked the doctor, what the heck is high T2 spots? He said, it's dead areas in the brain. I'm like, great, my brain's dry, drying up and dying. That's wonderful to know. <laughs> but you know what? I see it as the Lord preserved my life for a reason. And every day is a search to find that true, full reason why I'm still here. And I think it's because of you guys to share my testimony and to uh, show you how to paint, entertain you. Da -da -da. <laughs> All right. I hope I got some uh, people still watching and learning. We've got uh, I branched out on this uh, painting using dagger strokes. Again, like. Uh, I said earlier, uh, I'm using ETAC paints, slightly reduced with water, only a couple drops. I probably got about eight, uh, let's see, I probably got about four drops of water to two to three drops of paint. And I'm painting at about 
25 to 28 PSI. And this is Payne's Gray with a drop or two of blue in it. Just a little. And I'm just slowly building up these feathers. I mean, they're not really sharply defined on here. The main focal point on this uh, bird is uh, his beak and his eye. And then, so, I'm liking how it's looking so far. It's going to take a long time. I've already got uh, 41 and then another 24 minutes, so I've already got 65 minutes of video going. It's going to be a long haul if I want this to look right. One thing I do like to do is I like to kind of get the majority of the areas in. And uh, my reason for doing it that way, because a lot of people will do little sections at a time and fill it in and keep building around. And I've, I've worked that way a lot of times. But for the most part, let's see that, that's this big section here. For the most part, um, I want to keep an overall control of, on my contrast. And build slowly around. Um, then I come back in after and put in the little details. I'm not worried about overspraying over the top of this because this is all going to get dark. It's all going to be pretty much black back there. So I'm not worried about that. And it's also going to make the painting appear uh, nice and bright. This what, what you see now that looks like gray feathers is going to jump out and become uh, really bright uh, white feathers because of the contrast with the background. I only got a couple. I didn't draw in these, so I'm gonna freehand these in. Oh my goodness. I, I just threw my Q-tips flying across the room. It popped out of my fingers. So and rather than chase that and chance knocking things over, I'll just get a new Q-tip. You should have seen it go flying. I don't think you could see that on the video, but it went cruising across the room. I have to remember to pick that up or my grandson will find it and say, Papa Paint. Oh, he is adorable. He come up the other day, and over the other day, and he pulled out some finger paints and He's like, Papa paint, Papa paint. I'm like, okay, we'll paint after lunch. And he had a blast sitting on my lap doing finger paints. He's only two. Smart little fella too. He is smart. Just starting to make little sentences. Usually three, four word sentences. He tells me, Papa, sit here. Papa, sit here, and it'll jump on me. Graham kids are nice. They're great because you can spoil them and then send them home. I mean, that's a grandparent's privilege, isn't it? Spoil your grandkids. And if your your own kids complain about you, say. Hey, you're the mom and dad. I'm not. Quit your crying. Quit your crying. Alright. I got 
got some more painted in there. Cruising right along. Already looking like the forehead of that bird. Let's go back in with our scratch brush and pull out some more of this. I noticed over here it needed pulled out right here. See, and this is what happens when you uh, start moving on and you just keep looking. All of a sudden, you'll you'll spot something that. Oh, I got up. Fix that area. All right, that spot don't look quite right. What ain't right there? What ain't right? What ain't right in my brain? I'm loving being able to help people. I could spend hours and hours just fiddling with little spots in here, getting it just so. That's the fun part about painting this way. I came, uh, I started as a t-shirt artist. Uh, and I still love to do t-shirts. That's, that's the fun thing, but you just can't. You can't sit there and once you get it down on its t-shirt, it's hard to correct it if you did something wrong. And so you, ha you have to really learn. I think actually, I'll tell you this, and this is my opinion. I don't know about anybody else, but it was one of the best things that I ever did was teaching myself how to t-shirt paint because when you painted, you had to be almost as exact as you could and learn to really control your spray. And what I mean by that is you had to do every little dagger stroke to make fur going around your painting to make like a tiger's head and follow the patterns around the inner eye and around the the eyebrow and around the cheek and down the m nose and when you painted that way you couldn't take away you could only add you could only do an additive style of painting so you start you learn your layers you learn your color then you learn your misting to net tech to na 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 your misting techniques and then how to enhance it and uh, sharpen it up at the end and uh, I th I think it was the best way for me for learning how to uh, paint. Because now in this I can come back in and erase away to sharpen for the details and relay all that layering into using the scratch pen and or a scratch brush to make my details and then I can come back and layer over that and create even sharper details not everything has to be done with an airbrush it's a tool, it's an extension of, uh, kind of like an extension of your own mind to be used. Okay, that's looking pretty good. The only thing I gotta do now 
is I gotta pay attention to the contrasts and the values of some of these spots coming up so I can get them right. So right now I'm just gonna mist to get these spots correct so it's not so flat. Oh, okay, this comes up like here. And as you can see, because this is transparent paint, I can build on each layer and it continues to darken. Where if it was opaque, I could only get to a certain saturation of paint. And then it would stop getting darker. It would just be building up thicker paint. Okay. Now, let's see. Where is this going? This has one coming up here. And then this one's here. Okay, that's where I'm at right now. That's how I'm keeping control of where I'm going with this. And this gets the flow of those feathers. You get an idea in the sense of that flow. And over here it's getting a little lighter. That could use a little more shadowing there. And this one's only short here. Now that's starting to give you that sense of it wrapping around. This is in the main highlight. Now this is wrapping back around into the shadows. See how I just missed it over to push back this underneath those ridges of feathers coming up. It's almost like tufts of hair on your head when you've got wavy hair. Now within these are some highlights. So we'll go back into this and just pick up some of those highlights. We don't have to do all of them this time, just the brighter ones, which are mostly right on the edge as that feather rolls over. I want to get this in here right. Let's start from here. This is these going these way. And these will go up a these way. And then this comes like so. We got that one going like that. And then we got some here. Let the bristles do their work. Gives you so much more ability to manipulate. If you scratch it right back down to the surface, it's going to be flat. It's not going to have life in it. Because over here, the feathers just on this eyebrow they tuck in at this beak, but then they puff out. And you want the little edges to be catching that 
light. Not the whole part of the feather like over here. You're just having little tufts catching the light. And you'll begin to see the sense, uh, the sense of the pattern in the feathers. And it becomes easier to tell where you're at. There's so many little ridges on these feathers, so it's, it's going to look a little scratchy. But that's okay, that's, that's how these feathers look on this reference. They look scratched in. Uh, dishwasher's done. Aren't you glad you get to join me in my household chores? <laughs> uh, actually, I gotta stop for a real brief second. I'll be right back. I'm going to zoom in here a little bit so you can see what I'm doing. Now you're at an angle, so. But there you can see a little more. And you can see that little scratching and detail that I'm putting in there. Now, of course, you're at an angle, so it's Hard to see. I mean, when I'm standing in front of it, it's not as dark. On here, it's on the camera, it's it's quite a bit darker. And if I knew how to adjust that filter to get it more exact to what I'm seeing here. I can't, so I won't. And we're still working on a lot of these little pin feathers. And we probably will be for a long, long, long time. I may even choose to advance and skip parts it's hard to become selective because I might say something very enlightening. You pray like, shut up. You talk like a fool. You ramble.
One thing I would love to do is get a bunch of us airbrush artists together. Um, I know I know you're going to say the expos and that, but uh, I mean just a time of airbrush artist fellowship. And uh, sit around together and chat about what we're doing. Actually, see physically for firsthand. Talk about our experiences. Unfortunately, one of my friends, most of my friends, live way too far away, either overseas. That's the beauty of modern day technologies is uh, how we're so connected now with uh, other people far away. Never, never before. And that's something like even the, the Bible tells us is gonna is indicative of the end times is uh, the ability of man to uh, be able to communicate across the globe within seconds and in real time. Because when the authors of the Bible, well, God's the only author, but when the apostles wrote their letters to the churches. And then uh, they put it together for the canon of scripture um, and voted on what, what books to put in. They actually cast lots, what they call casting lots, because they didn't want to leave anything out that, they, that God wanted in there. So they pretty much rolled the dice said, okay, these are what we have. Um, these are good. These are doctrines that teach about our faith in Jesus Christ, our resurrected Savior. Then they prayed about it and asked God to direct the fall of what they called lots. And our modern term probably was dice. And uh, God directed how the dice fell so that they would know they put together God's exact word. Kind of random chance, but definitely divinely inspired. But anyways, in uh, the book of Revelation, John talks about being given the vision of when the two... Witnesses return back, and a lot of people believe it to be Moses and Elijah. Uh, when the two witnesses come back, they will be murdered, and their bodies will be left in the streets. And uh, that the people would be able to watch them continually from everywhere in the world. Now think about it. Back when the Bible when uh, when these this book of revelation of Jesus Christ was first written John had no clue how this would be ever possible when all they had was the ability to travel to uh, different places and talk about what was going on now we have satellites in the sky we have the ability to communicate across the globe in real time. So therefore that prophecy is easily fulfilled now in our day and age. Just unreal, unreal how, how accurate the Bible is. Just one further proof to me that 
It's God's divine inspired word. Now I've really probably lost some people out there watching. They don't want to hear this. They don't want to be preached at. I'm going to need to take a break on this very soon. My head is hurting even worse. It's the sacrifice I make. What's that you say? Why don't I pray that God heals it? I have. But like Paul said, he has given me a thorn in the flesh to bear and it keeps me relying on him. Not on my own strength. Get these little bitty hairs in here, or little bitty feathers. Right. Let's pause this video for a minute and uh, I go take care of my. Okay, I have a. Uh, Gotten in a little tighter here. I gotta tighten up this. Excuse my hand as I tighten my tension knob there. And adjust. There we go. I wanted to get in a little tighter here so you could uh, watch as I put some of these details in. So, I don't have much strength left to keep painting today. Uh, kind of not in full sorts, but I want to uh, get a little bit of this finer detail in so you can see how I'm actually working this and how small I'm going to get. And I'm going in between these little lines. See if I can't zoom in a little more for you. Okay. Okay, Arr, this thing's so tight, which is good because then it could hold my iPad if I wanted to. Bear with me, guys. And I got to remember where I'm at. <laughs> so, you know, All right, that's pretty good. All right. I'm going to work in this little area right here, obviously. And, uh, Okay, this is this one here. Okay. Just doing little, little fine hair lines in between these. I don't want them real strong, but I want it to really kick up the detail. Okay. I'm using my pinky little, just a little bit on this to uh, Keep my distant consistency. See? 
distance consistent that distance is, is to be consistent on my distance from the painting and I've got it, the brush angled so that you guys can see I usually paint a little more straight on that's one trick you can use to uh, to make sure you're I had an itch on my nose, sorry. To direct your overspray. No matter what, you're going to have overspray. It's just part of the way an airbrush works. But if you can manipulate it and use it, it's that much better. Got to knock back under a little bit. Okay, now we got two real definite marks here. We're going under that. And again, they stay consistent with this pattern. Always make sure you start your air pointed away from your thing if you notice I turn like that. Because if you got a little dot of paint sitting on that needle tip when you hit that air pressure on, it's going to spit and you're going to have a repair to make. And you're going to be mad at yourself. A lot of people might be saying and asking, why so much preaching today? Why so much talking about God? Why you always got to talk about God? And uh, the only thing I can do is answer you with a Bible verse. The Bible says you are to be instant in season and out of season. And to be ready to give to any man an answer for the reason for your faith. Do you have to accept it? No. Do you have to agree with it? No, you don't have to. Do you have to listen to it? No. Do I have to talk about it? Yes, I do. Because I would prefer to see all my friends on Facebook, on YouTube, and on my website enter into the kingdom of heaven along with me and share in eternity with all of us that the Lord has called I mean no man knows when his last breath is going to be and if you knew tomorrow was your last day or tonight was your last breath that you were going to take on this earth. One should be willing to ex listen and receive that free gift. The worst is people don't understand their human condition. We're all lost sinners by the Ten Commandments, God's perfect law. It was given so that it would draw us to the cross. You can take a little test to know where you're at, even. You say, how can I take a test? Well, when God gave Moses the Ten Commandments to take down to the people, it said that in the New Testament, 
I believe it was Timothy. I could be wrong about that. That said, the law is a schoolmaster driving us to the cross. We have to see our need for a redeemer. You say, how do I know that I need a redeemer? I'm a good person. And I spoke those words myself many, many years as I was growing. So you say, okay, am I a good person? Let's put it to the test. Let's take it to the Ten Commandments, God's perfect law, and test it there. And the first commandment is, Thou shalt not have any false gods before thee. Mm. Most people are guilty of that. Because most people have airbrush, they have golf, they have baseball, they have fishing, they have family, money. Any of those things can be your God. If they become more important than the Lord. So, most all of us are guilty right there. Then, do you lie? Have you ever lied in your life? I will guarantee 100% of people have lied. Whether it's a little white lie, whether it's a big, huge, fat lie. So that makes us all liars. Okay, now we're guilty of false gods before Christ. We're guilty of being a liar. Then you have to ask yourself, have you ever stolen? And not just big things like stealing a car or something. I mean little things. Paper clips, pencils, pens from work. Uh, time. You can steal time away from your job or even God. You can steal God's time. So we're all thieves. Okay, so now we're adult idolaters, we're liars, we're thieves. Have you committed adultery? You know, no, I didn't slip. I've never slept with someone that's not my spouse. Okay, but Jesus said, even so much as you look upon another with lust in your heart, you've committed adultery. Now, how many people out there have looked upon a woman, whether you're a man or a, looked upon a man, if you're a woman, and thought, I would love to go to bed with them. I would love to see them naked. I would love to be part of their life. Lusted after that person. Well, guess what? You're an adulterer. Okay. Last part of my little test is Thou shalt not take the name of thy Lord thy God in vain. How many people have reduced the precious name of Jesus Christ into a swear word? Used it out of context of prayer and talking. I think most all of us have. Uh, I have. I'm not going to lie. So I blas I've been a blasphemer. So now I'm guilty of that too. Have you ever looked at something in the neighbor's yard and coveted what they had? Whether it was a ski boat or a bass boat or it was a big car. And thought, oh, I, would, I want that. I want that for myself. That's coveting. Okay. The Lord said, Inasmuch as you are guilty of one thing in the law, you are guilty of the whole law. So, if we are guilty of the whole law, we are in need of a Redeemer. 
we are in need of a someone to pay that price for breaking the laws of the perfect and holy laws of God so that we can come into his presence and according to the Bible there's no remission of those sins against God other than a perfect sacrifice you have to pay for those choices you make So if you got to pay and yet you're guilty, you can't. In the Old Testament sacrifices, a lamb without spot or blemish had to be sacrificed for a covering for their sins until the perfect Lamb of God came to be sacrificed on the cross. That true faith in that sacrifice on the cross by our Savior to pay for your sins then you can enter into the gates of heaven by faith ye are saved through acceptance and repentance we need a God we have a loving God that gave us that on the cross. He gave his life up, the perfect, the just for the unjust. Why would he do that? Why would he bother for a sinful man like me? Because he loves us. He wants to take our sins upon his body as he suffered on the cross, died on that cross for those sins to pay the penalty. And through his blood sacrifice on that cross, we can be redeemed. The price we should pay, he paid for us. bringing us into the presence of the Father in heaven. He who knew no sin became sin for us. everybody off this video now and if I have a sacrifice I have to make for my faith Jesus said to his disciples the one time who do you say I am and the disciples all were saying, well, you're a prophet, you're a teacher. Who do others say that I am, he asked them. Well, some say you're the prophet Elijah, come back. Some say you're Moses, come back. And he said, but who do you say that I am? And Peter, Peter turned to him and said, you are the son of the living God. That made him equal with God himself. That was blasphemy in the eyes of the Jewish teachers. And uh, Jesus said, blessed are, you, blessed are you, Peter, because the Spirit has revealed that to you. You did not know this on your own. And he called him Petros. You're the little rock. And he 
he said, but upon this rock. Jesus is the rock of our salvation. Upon this rock, the rock of our salvation, I will build my church. Just touches a heart. Oh, I hope you're enjoying this. Uh, um, getting a little off track. Yeah. But if I'm not faithful to share, then all this is for nothing. Just a blowing wind, a creaking door. As you can see, I'm putting in a lot of these little fine misty lines in here just to bring out the fur more. That fur, I'm still stuck on fur. I am very sorry. The feathery looking fur. Let's see if I can get that a little brighter for you guys. Yeah, that's not too bad. But I'm probably going to take a stand still on this. I might, I might, uh, I'm going to hit this with my scratch print pen so I can take a breather, let my head uh, relax. Got to give these bones a little rest here. And we're going to work in this for a while. You know what I'm going to do? I think I'm going to get a stool to sit on. I'm sit on the stool here and work on this, my... My feet hurt. I have, uh, I also have a problem in my feet that's called a, uh, Morton's neuroma in my feet. That's the nerves in between the, uh, nerves in between the bones in the feet. are uh, being irritated and it swells and puts pressure on the nerves and you get tissue growth and it's hurting as I stand. I used to think it was uh, diabetic nerve pain and nerve damage from diabetes, but the more I read about nerve pain from diabetes, it didn't match. And everybody kept saying, that don't sound like that. So I did some more research, and sure enough, exactly what I'm feeling matched what this Morton's neuroma was describing. I'm a world of hurt in my weakness I am made strong These are all short little bumpy pin feathers in here. There's lots of little tiny marks. It's not as long as what was above. Okay, and 
up here it goes a little bit longer. This comes up like this. See, as that sat on there a little longer, it uh, scratches off a lot more intense intent. Uh, 